Okay, you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So now, since I didn't have the camera on on the first talk, I'm going to go ahead and redo that talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But um, okay. So, but I, what I was saying was the first talk, though. Um, actually, we've done two already. Right? Yes. So the first talk was on stewardship, and it's basically both, both two talks. We were trying to cover all of this, right? I ended up with practicality, and, I did, and that list was not exhaustive, but I was trying to give you things that you should think about that you might want to do in order to be a good Catholic, because good Catholics are all about being good stewards, because that's what God wants. It wouldn't be in the parables otherwise. That's, you, you need to be a good steward of what God gave you. That's what's going to come up at your judgment. All right. Um, so we, um, we we talked about discipleship. That's a little bit of a narrow band, though, to say discipleship. You know, because that was uh, that deals with um, being you know stewards of the knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Okay, and we've got that. But it's it's um, uh, in other words, being a witness. But remember, it's not just a witness. Maybe it maybe it does. I don't know. But remember, it's P D E. It's the whole thing. And which is all love. And it actually started with loving God first, loving yourself, and then loving your neighbor through PDE. Okay, so that's the summary of all that. And then I gave you all the practicalities. We, we, you know, we went prayer, uh, and then um, you know, uh, being a strategist, renouncing the world, the devil, and the flesh, accepting the evangelical councils, participating in them, Receiving the sacraments, okay, and then I went through all that. So now, what we, we, we want to do is we want to focus on, you know, remember number one was, in the beginning was, uh, give God what is, his, what is his due, and then give yourself what is your due. Well, what's your due to yourself? Virtues. Hot dogs? <laughs> Holy virtues. Um, the virtues, that's right. Holiness. Okay? If you, want, if you wanted to try to quantify holiness, you know, it's like God, but it's virtue. Jesus is the quintessential man of virtue. He's perfect. He's, he has all the virtues perfected. So did his mother. Okay, and that's a huge mystery. But, now what we're going to do is... I want to talk a little bit about... So first, let's start with... Let's start with... Uh, what is a virtue? Can you guys give me a definition? A good habit. A good habit, that's right. You better, with, you better think of the word habit if you're going to think of virtue. But there's a little bit fuller uh, description than just a good habit, right? Good, good job, Sam. I like that. You brought up the word disposition and the good. The good. Okay, what is the good? Well, it's God's will. It's whatever's good in the moment. So you have a disposition, an inclination to do that. Don't we have an inclination to sin? Oh, yeah. And copies. That's right. You, this virtue is anti sin, it's your remedy to sin. Because already, you're already leaning in the direction of sin because of your, the fall of mankind. And so virtue is uh, building up that sort of trying to lean you the other way toward doing what's good in every moment. All right? So the catechism says human, human virtues are firm attitudes, stable dispositions. In other words, you're not real flip-floppy on this. Like sometimes I'm generous, other times I'm not so generous. I can't tell. It's up to my mood. No, that's not virtue. All right? Uh, so stable dispositions, habitual perfections of the intellect and the will that govern our actions, order our passions, and guide our conduct according to reason and faith. Okay? Uh, sounds like a lot. It's a big, big, big line there. But, you know, you got to just remember. Um, if you just... If you don't reason your way through things, won't your human body and mind kind of just go AWOL? 
on you? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, that, that's because you're, you're, you're inclined to sin. So your passions, what are your passions? Love of this and that, fear, hatred, um, just all these uh, feelings that you have, right? And then you have all your instincts, okay? And these things are all leading you. You know, they're good things, but, they don't, but they're not good when they're not in the right measure, right? You have an instinct to eat, don't you? Can that go too far? <laughs> you have an in instinct to reproduce. Can that not go too far? Right? All, but they're all good, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have more human beings. Right? But all those things, right? So, but you've got to apply reason, and, and the catechism said, and faith, because there can be kind of this distinction there. Some things that you, they're, they're reasonable, but they're things that you couldn't have come up with just your mind. You know? You needed to hear and then you would know it. You, you would hear it by God. So, re, so by reason and faith, you apply all that sort of um, wisdom toward the human person and say, I got to overcome all the natural tendencies that won't lead me to the good. That's what a, that's what a virtue is, right? And so it says in the, in the um, it says, they make possible ease, self-mastery, and joy. Ease. So in other words, if you gain the virtue of generosity um, and you were a stingy person to start with, <laughs> you, uh, you, every time you actually were generous in the beginning, boy, was it rough. Your stomach was turning inside as you gave out that 10 bucks to that guy on the street. You're like, ah! And he wouldn't, even say, he wouldn't even say thanks. And you were burning up inside, right? Yeah. Right? But when you get, you develop the virtue of, of, um, of generosity, you're like, there you go. Take that. Take this. Oh, you need something. Take this. Take that. Take that. To the point where you forget yourself. That's, that's a virtue. Right? Now, but don't, don't get me wrong. The virtues work uh, in conjunction with each other so that, like, the example of generosity, you find, you find a guy that's in need. You know, I, have, I had somebody come to me the other day. And she said, can I stay in the back house? Because there's a back house at our rectory. I was like, I don't have a homeless shelter set up. It's dangerous for me to let people stay on our property. I know, the, I know our diocese doesn't want me to. I mean, if we wanted to turn it into a homeless shelter, we were going to need to do that. So what did I need to use? I need to use prudence, right? To be able to go along with my generosity. Now, if her life was threatened, ah, well, you know, the, the, the long-term plan on homeless shelter is out the window because her life's at stake. So you see what I'm saying? But there's all this um, interaction of the virtues. They all have to be used together. Right? And that's what I want to talk about today is this, <coughs> is this, this uh, if you really want to gain, a virtu gain the virtues and perfect them, and it, by the way, it all funnels into the perfection of charity. Okay. If you want to do that, you need to learn how they work together. Okay? Um, so, by the way, Christians uh, are not the only people that ever talked about virtues. So this is something in the world that people recognize. Philosophy, really. Uh, the philosophers, um, they study the human person. And they say, you know, we want to make the best of being a human being. Philosophy, right? All the way, especially back to the Greeks, they were pretty good at this, right? These early uh, 400 years before Christ, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, right? Now, Aristotle wrote something called the Nicomachean Ethics. You ever heard of that? So I, I, I think I need to read it because I, I found a little uh, nugget out of it by perusing the internet. But um, it says, uh, Aristotle spends much of the Nicomachean Ethics discussing the excellences of particular human activities that would need to come together in a coherent life in order for one to flourish. You know, that's not too far from Christianity. As a matter of fact, you realize that um, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas essentially used Aristotle. He called him the teacher. I think that was what he said. He called Aristotle the quintessential teacher. 
uh, so he, he loved Aristotle and his philosophy, and he basically baptized it. In other words, it needed to be, it needed to be, to be add, have the gospel added to it and, you know, and have it further explained. But what he said was good stuff. So what he, he talked about virtue. Essentially, a life that flourishes is one that is full of virtue. And it's nothing but excellences in human activity. Does that make sense? <coughs> Excellence. Right? And so he recognized the enemies. He recognized, this guy's not even Christian. Or even Jewish or any, any uh, religion. He basically recognized that the enemy is the, are the passions and the instincts. You know? He didn't have the devil in the world. <laughs> but he had the flesh. You get me? So, but we, we look at all of it, all of the temptations, and we say we need virtue to overcome and actually get to the point of doing the good when our body doesn't want to do it. You know, or even our will doesn't want to do it. Okay? So, um, but as I said, it's applying reason and the will to the passions and the instincts. And by use of habit, it makes, it said, it said it makes for ease, self-mastery, and joy in leading a morally good life. So you are not called to just grin and bear it throughout the entirety of your Christian walk with God. You are not called to just grin and bear it. You are called to make ease for yourself um, and uh, self-mastery that means you're the one in, your mind and your heart your soul is in control not just your body okay and joy so it actually says the virtuous man is he who freely practices the good he freely practices it's easy and and actually um Actually, let me get into this. What would you say particularly, though, if Aristotle knew this kind of stuff, what particularly makes Christian virtue? What makes for Christian virtue? We already said, I mean, here's the thing. We said that reason and faith would, um, you know, would, um, we would, we would, Govern our actions, order our passions, and guide our conduct according to reason and faith. Well, Aristotle wasn't about faith. So certainly, faith must enter into the picture. In order to know what the good is, you've got to have faith. Okay, and, and you know, Aristotle didn't have everything right on, in terms of what is the good. All right? And that's why you have to tell someone when someone says, I think the only thing that counts is being a good person. Good person. You say, well, what is that? You need faith to know what a good person is. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, because God tells us what a good person is and what it means to do good in every little, you know, possibility of an action. All right. Now, but what, what really makes uh, virtue Christian is the assistance of grace. You can't achieve the perfection of the virtues without God's grace. God made all human beings to be fully virtuous, but he knew that his grace was necessary to make it happen. You get me? So you've got to follow Jesus if you want to be a virtuous person, completely. Aristotle did pretty well, but he wasn't the follower of Jesus. Well, he's 400 years before Jesus. But okay. So the Catechism says human virtues are acquired by education, by deliberate acts, and by a perseverance ever renewed in repeated efforts are purified and elevated by divine grace. Okay? With God's help, they forge character and give facility in the practice of the good. Facility, meaning it makes it easy. Practicing of the good. Okay? You know, you got a problem with lust? Well, if you become virtuous in the virtue of chastity it becomes easy you get your eyes back to where they need to go easily you say nice try devil 
you're not going to get me on that. You see this beautiful person, woman, man, whatever, and you're like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm comfortable. I don't care that there's a beautiful person walking by me or whatever, or, or I even have to minister to her. <laughs> or I get to minister, whatever you want to say. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you have self-mastery, and, you, and you've already got this all under control. But, and you're happy to do it. It's not a pain. That's a, vir that's a virtuous. Um, so, um, it says, gives facility to the practice of the good. The virtuous man is happy to practice them. Happy to practice them. Okay, so. Uh, so here's the thing. We've all thought about this idea that our faith life involves action. You know, uh, St. James says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can th that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So, is virtue involved here? Yeah. How do you give to people what they're in need of if you don't have virtue? You need virtue to accomplish it. So, as I was telling you before, um, this is a big thing with Catherine of Siena. You want to love your neighbor, then you prove your virtues on your neighbor. Okay, and that's why... So I'm starting with all that because I want to talk about the relationship of the virtues with themselves and how do we, how do we acquire it. Well, we already talked, the definitions themselves talk about it. It's these repeated efforts, okay, and with the God's grace. And it's all informed by our reason and faith, with it, which informs our reason, okay? And so it's sort of putting a rein on a whole bunch of horses. You've got your 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 whole being as a human being, you have all these emotions and you have powers and it all comes together. Um, but in order to use them to flourish, as Aristotle said, you've got to put a rein on all of the horses, get them all going like that Budweiser. Um, Clydesdale. 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 Yeah, you know. Um, so, Certain virtues are nurtured by other virtues, and they rely on other virtues. Did you ever hear that before? They're nurtured, and they rely on other virtues, okay? So here's the thing. I've seen a few different explanations of um, the relationship of the virtues, and they each have this use of the analogy of a tree, okay? with branches that lead to fruit. Okay, what do you think the fruit is? Well, it's the proving of those virtues, and it's love. Okay? So, if there's fruit for you to bear as a tree that God planted, you need to bear love. You are all to be trees of love. This is St. Catherine of Siena. You are all to be trees of love. And what it, the very fruit itself is at the end of a branch. What's that little branch where the fruit is connected to? What would you call that branch? A limb. limb, okay. But what is it standing for? That's right, virtue. That's right, it, but one of the virtues, okay? But that's connected to a bigger branch, and then those branches are connected to the trunk, and the trunk's connected to the roots and the heart of the tree, as God says. Okay, and I'm going to explain that. That's in that picture right there, but before we start into the picture of the explanation of Catherine of Siena, um, I wanted to just show you that this actually purportedly was not a new idea at the time of Catherine of Siena. This was 1370, Catherine of Siena. But uh, when I looked this up on, in the uh, you know, uh, uh, Wikipedia and you know, stuff that's on the internet, it's showing me that there are drawings of vir trees of virtue that actually came uh, in the 13th century, in the, like the 1200s. Okay, they go back as far as that. So I wanted to, I brought a couple of those with me. So 
it's all in Latin, so it's kind of hard to read, but these are some ancient uh, images of tree of virtue, okay? It's not precisely Catherine of Siena and what God said in there. In fact, I've never seen a rendition of it. I had to draw my own, and it wasn't easy. I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks. So, but here's, so like this one, actually what these two are, they're, they're, they're the opposite of each other because vice actually has the very same kind of, vice is nothing but the fruits uh, or the branches um, of a tree of self-love. You thought it was me hate, huh? No. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite of the tree of love. Tree of self-love. But Father, I thought we're supposed to love ourselves. Christmas time, I go out and buy Christmas for my presents for myself. <laughs> That's a little too much, though. That's the problem. You have self-love. The self-love you need are the virtues so that you're able to love. But if you're nothing but a tree of self-love, the world's full of it. Okay? Then what happens? Then you end up with vices, which are in place of the branches, which would have been virtues. And everything's a drooping tree. And it goes nothing but down to the earth. And death is the end point, is what God calls it. Ultimately, hell. But it, it leads to mortal sin and death. Okay? And, um, but, they, but they follow the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of a pattern. Just like, in a sense, heaven and hell have, have like mir are mirror images, aren't they? In some sense, right? The people that will be grouped together in heaven, they're going to actually, God told us through Catherine, that they're going to be grouped together according to their virtues, their strengths. So if you're real good at something, you're going to hang out with people like you in heaven, like that. Everybody's going to be at your disposal, but the place where you're going to go. Okay? But the same thing in hell. If, if, you, if you have a certain vice, you know, um, what's an example of a vice? Um, Alcoholism. Alcoholism. Mm -hmm. or, uh... No, I want to say like you know somebody with no chastity. They're 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 lustful. They're, womanizer. Well, they're you know they fornicate or they're they're very uh, promiscuous. Yeah, they fall into lust. Lust is actually a big category though, and then it has all these different areas. Um, but I just want to say well, all those people that commit those sins of the flesh like rampantly, they're going to be around each other in hell, oh. and it's going to be sickening for them. Nobody likes anybody in hell. You think they like each other? Think they like the devil? No. They don't, actually. By the time you get there, it's like, you know how we look over to God in heaven and it's nothing but joy looking at God? They have to look at the devil and it's nothing but pain. Ugh. Look at that guy. And they look at each other too, all the other people with the same problem they have, and it's sickening. Sorry, I don't mean to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, they made all these, they made these, um, these, uh, this is a, like a tree of death and of, ver of vice, okay? All the, all the fruit is actually hanging down on this one, except for these top ones, but they're all hanging down, right? And this very top thing right here, instead of, in this one, this, this virtue, it actually says uh, caritas, so it's, it's, it's charity. Charity is at the top there, and it's got all of its daughters, and sons, you might say, children, or these other branches, which are other virtues. Showing the Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, so you got that and that, and um, but see, this one where the where the the fruit, the fruit of this one's all pointed up toward heaven, except for these top ones. No, no, these ones all, but th this one, it's all down. But um, you know, the different areas. Actually, I wrote some of these down because I had to kind of look this up. So the tree of vice is lust, gluttony, greed, the seven yes. capital yes. sins, okay? But those are all virtues, I mean vices, okay? And then there's the tree of virtue in these, in these ancient examples, and charity, concord, liberality, compassion, piety, grace, peace, indulgence, mercy, kindness, meekness. Then there's faith. Under faith is generosity, religion, chastity, obedience, self-control, reverence, affection. And then under hope, Hope is another one of these um, major seven. You've heard of the you've heard of the um, uh, the the no the the four um, 
cardinal virtues. They're cardinal because they're hinge points, because from them, they are the parent virtues of many other virtues, okay? Um, so like if you're having trouble with uh, religion or chastity or obedience, it's because you don't have enough faith, because faith was the branch that led you there, okay? And then there's hope, and under hope is confession, long-suffering, patience, consideration, contrition. Some of these might be wrong. I just had to get translations from this, from this uh, Latin. Anyway, somebody could probably do a better job figuring out how we used to categorize all these things. But I just wanted you guys to see how it works, right? So basically the way these charts worked is they made seven. The seven are the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and then the four cardinal virtues, okay? Um, so the four cardinal is temperance, fortitude, justice, and prudence, okay? And so under them are all these daughters and sons. Okay, and then finally, at the end of all the branches is the fruit of love, because you proved the virtue. You get it? Okay. Now, uh, there's a book that the Dominicans put out, these Dominican sisters, where they tried to put sort of a modern version of that, and this is what they, this is what it looks like. So they made this tree. Okay. And uh, I mean, you know, these are helpful things. And so, but how did, how did his tree work? Um, well, this is a, a, a Dominican. His name is um, uh, Service Pinic, uh, Pinkeris. He's a Dominican. And um, this was in a book, The Catholic View of Morality. And uh, he says, I mean, you know, their book, the Dominican's book says, the, this virtue tree is a fitting metaphor for the life of virtue. Just as the roots of a tree hold it in place, so do the theological virtues root us in God. So, if you're not connected to the earth with this tree, you are not connected to God, and therefore you will never receive charity, which is at the heart of but you also won't receive the other theological virtues. Where do we, when do we get those th theological virtues? Faith, hope, and charity. Anybody know? Baptism. At your baptism, that's right. They're infused. But you have to develop them. Okay, but faith, hope, and charity. See those three, see those three little like roots? That's what this rendition is saying. It's those three roots. Faith, hope, and charity. And then they, re they lead up to the big branches. And I think... So in the middle of those, it, it has put gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is what this Dominican did, okay? And it's a gift of wisdom, gift of fear, and knowledge and understanding. So he put those in the trunk, and charity was one of the main roots, okay? And then what goes up are the four cardinal virtues, Prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance, and then from there the other virtues that sort of fall in. But then there's a few more gifts of the Holy Spirit that it it wound in there that I'm not sure how these, but they're wound in there somehow. Because you have to, here's the thing, that can be very confusing to you, I realize. The gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. What's the difference? Well, one's receiving the other. One's you, one you're showing, one you're, one you're giving. Gift and fruits, yeah, okay. The gifts are what you receive and the fruits are what you produce. Okay, but here's the thing. Yeah, I mean, this is what I want to say. Look, there are two ways in which the Holy Spirit enters into your life and brings you to achieving the good. One of them is by way of virtue. Um, and I, you know, I'm not sure if I have this totally right. Like, there's different classifications of virtue. You know, there's the human virtues, there's the moral virtues, and there's all this stuff. Okay, but let's just simplify it. There's the virtues which you must develop by your habit, and those are the ones that we defined with the catechism, right? And they're going to make ease in doing the good, right? But it's using the reason and faith 
from above to, um, you know, to put order to all of your passions and feelings and everything, instincts, okay? Now, here's the thing. In order to develop those virtues where you get, it becomes easy to be generous over and over again, or easy to be chaste, or whatever, it's because the Holy Spirit is giving you grace to make that process speed along because you're depending on God and his power to make you full of virtue and to perfect those virtues. So do you get that? So that now when I go walking down the street and I suddenly need to be patient because somebody is testing my patience, uh, I developed that virtue by way of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to kick into play as I prove the virtue with love. Right? Do you, do you, do you understand? Okay. <laughs> now, what about a gift of the Holy Spirit? That's something a little bit different. So, like, if in this moment I need to be patient, what can work in conjunction with that is the wisdom to choose the right things, to be patient. Do you get me? And what is wisdom? Wisdom really is a virtue, but it's a special virtue that we call a gift. But what is that gift? It's nothing less than wisdom is this ability to put the proper weight on everything. You know, the wise virgins, remember what they do? They kept their lamps, lamps burning. They, got, they had extra gas, oil, right? It was wise. Why? Because their priority was salvation. Wise people listen to the word of God. They put a high priority on the things of the faith and all this stuff, right? But where do you get this, though, this wisdom? It, it's something that could be developed, obviously. But... What it is, is the gift of the Holy Spirit such that the Holy Spirit inspires you to have thoughts of wisdom. Okay? So, I know this may s sound a little bit like it's getting complicated, but let me, let me make it a little easier. The Dominicans will already know this example. But if you're trying to go to the other side of a lake and you have a point at which you're trying to go, right? Um, and you're in a boat... You need some motive force to get over there, right? Well, you could consider oars and your operating of the oars to be that motive force to go in the direction of the good, right? Now, if you had little tiny oars that didn't have much of a paddle on them, you know what I mean? It's kind of slipping through the water pretty easily. That's when your virtues are not developed because the oars represent the virtues. But they get developed through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's involved in this process already when I tell you virtues, okay? And they have, they, it's, you know, it has a paddle. And if you've got perfectly developed virtues, you go like this and you just move along with ease in the direction of the good, right? However, there's even one other way of motive force. What is it? It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. When you need to move in the direction of the good, wisdom, fortitude, um, uh, what are the other ones? Uh, knowledge, understanding, Justice. Uh, ju piety, piety, piety counsel. counsel. Okay, so you got all those, right? Those can sort of work in conjunction with those developed virtues to move you along toward the good. But what are they? Nothing but a sail that you have received from God as a gift, and you've developed that sail such that when the Holy Spirit wants to blow you in the right direction, your sail catching that, that, that inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, if the Holy Spirit inspires you and you're somebody that's receptive to the Holy Spirit, it's because you've got a gift. And then you move and you do what's good. You didn't even, your reasoning didn't even come into play. Virtue? Reasoning. Faith? Reasoning comes to play. Controls it in the right way, right? Got the rain on all the horses, right? But then there's this whole thing that's pushing you along by pure inspiration and a reception to that inspiration, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit. If your reception, 
I mean, if you're very receptive to the Holy Spirit, he's going to direct you in the way of wisdom. Okay? And then it's going to work in conjunction with all those virtues that you have developed. You get me? So that's how the Holy Spirit comes in. He helps you to develop nice big oars, and then he also helps you to develop a nice big sail. And then working it all together, you get going in the direction of the good. Make sense? Okay. Now, what I want to do now is I want to share with you. So you've already, okay, so you saw what the Dominican did. And this is, we, we use this book in the school, right, uh, Susan? Yes. Yeah, it's a good book. And I'm not saying that we don't want this for our model. At least you need a tree. So you can recognize that they're all, that the main, the main point of having a tree is a line from Catherine of Siena where he says that certain things come together and then they have children. And he's talking about virtues. And you realize, oh wow, like you can't have these certain virtues unless you got them from the parents. Okay, so you're, if you're having trouble in this area, you gotta go back sometimes to the, the, the bigger branch. So it's a very, helpful thing. And, and I recommend, I was telling you, you need to meditate as part of your, one of your practicalities. Meditate on your virtues. Try to find out where your weak points are. You're not going to advance in the spiritual life unless you do that. You need to analyze it and say, I can see. I have a problem with this area. I want to fix the, that one area or maybe even some of the branches leading up to it. Okay, so now I want to share with you what God the Father said to Catherine of Siena in 1370 about the virtues and, and the tree. He describes it um, like this. Certain virtues give rise to others by feeding them as the roots or the trunk or the branch. Like a tree, right? I mean, how do you get to this point right here unless you had started with here. You gotta start with the roots and you gotta go up the trunk and you gotta get through prudence and you gotta get to all the other, um, thanks man, all the other uh, you know, pathways to get there. Okay, so here's the thing. God the Father brought up a particular virtue that was, that was very important. It's the virtue of discretion, he says. Discretion. And some of the translations of the dialogue actually use a different word. I think it may be the same thing as justice. But it's, it deals with giving everything around you what it deserves, which is justice. But let's listen to the words of God, okay? Listen to this. This is what God said to St. Catherine. He said, this virtue, discretion, is no other than a true knowledge which the soul should have of herself and of me. Now I know, you're thinking humility, aren't you? Those are the ingredients. That's not actually humility. There's more to humility than self-knowledge. But certainly that's a big ingredient. Would you not agree? Most people that have trouble with humility, they have very little self-knowledge. Okay? Um, so, but he says, is no other than discretion, he says, is no other than a true knowledge which the soul should have of herself and of me. And in this knowledge is virtue rooted. So he's saying that virtue in general is rooted in discretion in this knowledge of self. And that's why, well, we'll get to it in a minute, but um, so he says, discretion is the only child of self-knowledge and Wedding with charity has indeed many other descendants. Discretion is the only child of self-knowledge. And wedding with charity has many other descendants as a tree which has many branches. Okay, so what did I do when I heard that? I said, okay, I want discretion to come with, together with charity and they're going to marry each other in the trunk of the tree. These two are wedded. They come together right here. Charity, discretion. They come together, and then there are many branches which lead to all the other virtues. Does that make sense? Okay. 
But we still have to figure out what discretion is a bit, and he's gonna talk about it. So, and then he says, but that which gives life to the tree, to its branches and its root, because he was talking about the roots there and the branches, right? Discretion is part of the tree itself. If you ripped out the tree from the, from the earth, you'd have discretion in there because it's in the tree itself, right? But he says, he says though that but that which gives life to the tree to its branches and its root is the ground of humility all right so and then he says in which is it is planted which humility is the foster mother and nurse of charity okay so humility is in the soil itself Okay, and it's the nurse of charity. Can anybody be really charitable if they're not humble? No, it gets all of its, you, so the point is, God is really in the earth, in the, in the analogy. He's in the earth, right? How do you, how do you f get fed from, it's, it's fine. I, more or less, I'm in the picture. Yeah. And my voice is in the microphone. <laughs> okay, so um, how do you, I mean, we need, this, we need these graces from God to help us to develop the virtues, don't we? And how do we get it unless it comes from God? But how do you get anything from God if you don't have humility? By the way, that's, this, that's tomorrow's homily. <laughs> You're going to hear that tomorrow. But how would you ever get anything from God if you don't have humility before God? Yeah, you, you end up with almost nothing. It's, it, by the way, humility is the holy grail of human life. It's the holy grail, you know what I'm saying? You know, that's, everybody is searching for that. Everybody wants that. Some people, it's, it's already their strength. Glory to them. They're gonna have to work on other stuff, but other people like me, <laughs> I gotta work on that first. I gotta get the humility down first. Then I can receive the life blood of God through the soil. You know, from, I mean, th from the earth, right? And um, if you want to receive a lot of God's life blood, which actually seems to be charity, because it's like, you need discretion, you need to connect with this thing that he's going to call the circle, I'll read that to you in a minute, but you need to get from down here in the earth, and, um, and then what's going to come back up is this, Divine virtue, charity. And you need to try to perfect your charity, your love of God. Love of God is actually a gift which gives you the capacity to love everything that you must love. So, but it's got to come from the bottom and up the trunk. Okay? Now, uh, so it says discretion is the only child of self-knowledge and wedding with charity has indeed many other descendants as a tree which has many branches but that which gives life to the tree to its branches and its root is the ground of humility which is planted in which it is planted which humility is the foster mother and nurse of charity by whose means this tree remains in perpetual calm of discretion. Bear with it. It's a little complicated. Because otherwise the tree would not produce the virtue of discretion or any fruit of life if it were not planted in the virtue of humility because humility proceeds from self-knowledge. And I have already said to you, the root of discretion is a real knowledge of self and of my goodness by which the soul immediately and discreetly renders to each one his due. And I call it justice as well, because he's given everybody what they owe. He says, chiefly to me, in rendering praise and glory to my name, and guess what, we're getting back to what we said earlier. Chiefly to me, in rendering praise and glory to my name, and in referring to me the graces and the gifts which she sees and knows she has received from me. That's discretion. That's the definition. Yeah. yeah. That's discretion. 
you actually, you have this knowledge of what a little speck you are and how big God is and how good he's been to you and everything good that you've ever been involved with is all him. So you attribute all the graces, you know, and, um, and you do what you should with the graces he gives you. And you do what you should with the graces he gives you. And so uh, he says, and in referring to me the graces and gifts which she sees and knows she has received from me and rendering to herself that which she sees herself to have merited. So there is some things that she earned merit, but it was always with the grace of God. But she actually can see. She's not like saying like, I'm like, I have no good in me. People are fake if they're just, they're, they're, they, this is not true humility. If you, if you won't even recognize that you've done some good with God's help. Okay? Um, but there is, in other words, they don't deny that there is such a thing as merit. And that they are going to deserve some. Okay? Uh, and then he says... Knowing that, she, knowing that she does not even exist of herself and attributing to me and not to herself her being, which she knows she has received by grace from me and every other grace which she has received besides. You see, if you get into trouble in this whole process of your relationship with God, you're going to get nowhere with God. And you'll, go get, you'll get nowhere with the flourishing of life. You have to be connected with God and be grateful you have to be grateful and recognize where everything good you're doing is coming from God. And then he wants to pour it on. He doesn't want to pour it on when you don't have discretion, when you want to attribute it to yourself. And that's such a big temptation. And then he says, and she seems to herself to be ungrateful for so many things, benefits and negligent in that she has not made the most of her time and the graces she has received and the graces she has received and so seems to herself worthy of suffering. So when she begins to suffer in life, she's like, well, I deserve this. You know, most people, when they get suffering in life, it, it turns, them, turns them bitter. And they almost, they become angry with God because they ultimately know God's in charge of this suffering. But it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's almost like hell because it's a, it's a continual downward spiral. But if you, God did not give us the true ability to, to, to estimate, you know, our own goodness. And so there is a little bit of uh, room for error in the estimation of my own holiness and my own goodness. Is that not true? Can you really estimate your own holiness and goodness? Self knowledge. You can't, but you're working on self knowledge, and that includes that. But, but so, what God is doing here is He's trying to show us that a good person errs on the side of estimating themselves lower, worthy of, worthy of every suffering they've ever gotten. They've gotten a good deal with God. Like, if you think that you've been mistreated by God and you've gotten a, a raw deal you're, you're going to have trouble but see as you sit here and estimate all these things if you just estimate yourself I'm not really like the, I gave this retreat and the, and the people didn't like it well you know what I, I don't blame them <laughs> so but that's but where does that come from it comes from humility right because you're, you're inclined to estimate yourself lower than you probably are but you're happy because you want to make sure you don't want to overestimate because that messes you up. All right? But if you're going to err, you err on that side. So that's why he's saying, um, she so seems to herself worthy of suffering. Wherefore, she becomes odious and displeasing to herself through her guilt. So in other words, she begins to hate her own um, sinfulness and her own... Um, Pride. Well, she... Yeah, hold on. Okay. So she, she, uh, Sorry. that's all right. So she, she, uh, she recognizes her own, uh, the faultiness of the fallen man in her, right? We call this the, uh, 
the, the sensuality, okay? I'm a slave to my senses and all of my instincts and passions. And she hates that about herself because she knows to become like God, you have to rise above that. You see that? See, most other uh, theologies, they don't actually talk about hating yourself. Catherine of Siena does, because it's the truth. You do need to hate yourself in the right measure. You have to hate all of your, uh, your limitations to uh, doing what's good and right. And virtue is what builds you up to give you that ability. But he's going over what is actually able to feed your virtue is this, is, is this disposition of discretion, which wants to give all the credit to God and wants to under, under, underestimate yourself. Does that make sense? You want to underestimate yourself, okay? And then this leads to humility, which is the soil which allows you to be fed by God and become a flourishing tree, all right? Now, hold on. Um, so, so it says, and this founds the virtue, virtue of discretion on knowledge of self, that is, on true humility. It seems to involve, as I was saying, to safely underestimate oneself. For it is this humility, not in the soul, so I'm sorry, for were this humility not in the soul, the soul would be indiscreet. Indiscretion being founded on pride and discretion on humility. Okay? If you have humility, you're able to give the credit where it belongs. And you're also going to be safe and you're going to underestimate yourself. And not be demanding of all these and deserving of all these rewards already in this life. Okay? So, an indiscreet soul robs me of the honor due to me and attributes to herself through vainglory, that is, wanting to get glory for th things outside of God, and that which is really her own, she imputes to me. Okay, so when you make a mistake, you blame it on God. Grieving and murmuring concerning my mysteries with which I work in her soul and in those of my other creatures, wherefore everything in me and in her neighbor is a cause of scandal for her. She goes to confusion. She misunderstands everything in him and in her neighbor. In other words, all these things, she keeps misunderstanding the soul. Okay? Why? Because she does, she's not discreet. She does not know herself nor God and his goodness. Okay, I know, I'm not really, we're not really bringing it to like, uh, you know, boots on the ground, rubber meeting the road yet. And I don't know if that I ever will, but I am giving you stuff that God gave us and it is really golden. So I just, I want you to say, I want to know more about this. I want to understand this because there's something that's really valuable here. And, and, the, and the more you hear, you're going you're gonna to realize that. So um, he says, Contrarywise, those who possess the virtue of discretion, for when they have rendered what is due to me and to themselves, they proceed to render to their neighbor their principal debt of love and of humble and continuous prayer, which all should pay to each other and further the debt of doctrine and example of a holy and honorable life, counseling and helping others according to their needs for salvation. As I said to you above, Whatever rank a man be in, whether that of a noble, a prelate, or a servant, if he have this virtue, everything that he does to his neighbor is done discreetly and lovingly. Because these virtues are bound and mingled together and both planted in the ground of humility which proceeds from self-knowledge. Okay, so he says that as you go about and you do this PDE that I was teaching you before, you've got to do it he says, discreetly and lovingly. Look at the trunk of the tree. Lovingly from the love of God that he gave you the gift to do, to, have, to, be, to be able to love. And discreetly. You're never doing it saying that I deserve more than I'm getting. I'm not getting a good deal out of this life. That's indiscreet people. They don't think they're getting a good deal out of life. They're always getting ripped off and, and everything is a scandal for them. Do you understand me? 
And God's trying to head that problem off at the past by teaching you this. You really want to be a holy and virtuous person, you've got to continually connect back to God and his goodness and not overestimate what you deserve. It's pretty key. Okay, so now he says this. Do you know how these three virtues stand together? It is as if a circle were drawn on the surface of the earth and a tree with an offshoot joined to its side grew in the center of the circle. The tree is nourished in the earth, contained in the diameter of the circle. For if the tree were out of the earth, it would die and give no fruit. So that's why I told you, you cannot bear fruit without charity, which comes from God. If you don't love God, you will not gain more charity too. But if you do not have this love of God, you cannot bear fruit. That's why ultimately you realize that if you do a good deed outside the state of grace, do you get anything that would be a reward for heaven from that? Or a reward in heaven? You don't. Not on the, except on this earth. You'll get rewards. They're all earthly rewards. God says, I do reward the people who do good deeds. How does he reward it? I know Matt knows. Anybody else? No, don't worry. I want you to answer in a second. But anybody know? How does he reward people that do good deeds? Do people that are not in the state of grace, do they ever do a good deed? Yes. Of course they do. They're running around to all those um, uh, soup kitchens, figuring that being a nice person is going to get them to heaven, but they don't want to go to church. Do they love God? No, they're disobedient. If you're, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. They don't love God. So all those efforts they're doing, they're kind of, they're a little bit to waste. But the one, the one good thing God gives them back, what does he say? He says, I do reward them with an earthly reward because it's an earthly thing that they're doing. They're not doing anything heavenly or divinely because it's divinely if you do it under the state, in the state of grace and with the cooperation of God's graces. Okay? That is a meritorious deed. But these deeds are good. But he says, I give them more time. That's their reward. They might have died when they were 65. Now they're going to die at uh, 66. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, so you, you kind of get that? Okay, so Okay, so going back to this uh, diagram, so he says, uh, now consider in the same way that the soul is a tree existing by love and that it can live by nothing else than love. And that if this soul have not in the very truth divine love of perfect charity she cannot produce fruit of life but only death now by the way you just heard something that might have scared you because it said if, if, if she do not have love divine the divine love so it says that if the soul have not in very truth the divine love of perfect charity he's not saying that your charity is already perfected so if you haven't reached perfection already, well, then you can't do anything good that's going to be worthy of, of reward and uh, you know, the, produce the fruit of life. No, he's not saying that. But what he's saying is that charity itself is perfect because it comes from God. And if you don't have any of it, then you're in trouble. But you have to have that charity because you have a relationship with God. Why? Because you heard the gospel. You responded with faith. You repented. You're still kind of a crummy person, though you're like me <laughs> but you um, but you at least are in the state of grace right because you've accepted the truth you're now obedient and you and you love God to some degree right and now he's gonna pour his love back in you and that's called charity and it's only with that charity that you are able to do anything of any value do I make sense Okay, um, she cannot produce fruit of life, but only death. Okay, now, he says, it is necessary then that the root of this tree, that is the affection of the soul. See these roots? I wrote down here the affection of the soul. So there's a difference between your affections and God's charity. Yeah, don't worry about it. I, I'm cognizant. Okay, so... There, do you see what I just said? 
There's a difference between your affections and the charity from God. Charity from God, in some sense, is a reward here in this life. It's where he says, he says, to those who have been given much, more will be given. And to those who have very little, what little they have will be taken away. Okay? So charity is that ability for you to live divinely and to love like God. Okay? And so that is the Holy Spirit at work in you to develop the branches of the, of the virtues and also to give you the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, it is necessary then that the root of this tree is the affection of the soul, which is different from charity, should grow in and issue from the circle of true self-knowledge, which is contained in me. Okay, so the whole sort of crux of this thing being any good, of producing all these fruits up here of love, and then you going to heaven and hearing the well done line, <laughs> is it starts here at the heart of the tree. And the heart of the tree is the affection of the soul, which is directed toward God. God is in, is in the earth in this analogy, okay? And, but you can only receive God if you have affection. And he says the affection of the soul, and then it's going to connect patience to that. And it says, It is necessary then that the root of this tree, that is the affection of the soul, the root of the tree is the affection of the soul, should grow in and issue from the circle of self-knowledge, that's where your discretion comes from, remember? Which is contained in me who have neither beginning nor end. So that's why this circle down here, it, it, it's, uh, it's infinite. There's an arrow here. It's God. And it goes around and around. It's infinite. So it has no beginning nor end. You're connecting to God through that circle. Okay? And that's what gives you true self-knowledge. You see right here? Circle of self-knowledge. You won't get self-knowledge if you don't know God and you're not connected to him. That's why it's this circle because God is no beginning and no end. And you have to connect to that. And then it says, who have neither beginning nor end, like the circumference of the circle, for turn as you will within the circle, and as much as the circumference has neither beginning nor end, you, you always remain within it. Okay, so you have to remain in this. The knowledge of yourself and of me found in the earth of true humility, which is as wide as the diameter of the circle. Not everybody's circle is the same size. Some people, it's the little one right here. They only have so much self-knowledge. But the more self-knowledge you have, the wider it gets, the bigger your roots. The more affection you can have, and you can soak up um, what you need from God. Right? The truth. The charity. Okay? Um, and so humility is key. If you don't have humility, you, your branches are small down at the bottom. Okay? And that's the soil. To, um, this knowledge of yourself and of me found in the earth of true humility, which is as wide as the diameter of the circle, and the knowledge of self and of me, for otherwise the circle would not be without end or beginning, but have its beginning in, in knowledge of self and its end in confusion. So if you don't connect with God, you might learn a little bit about yourself, but you won't end with true knowledge of self. You'll end in confusion. Okay? And um, if this knowledge were not contained in me. So, um, then the tree of love feeds itself on humility, bringing forth from its side the offshoot of true discretion in the way that I have already told you, from the heart of the tree, that is, the affection of love which, the, which is in the soul, and the patience which proves that I am in the soul and the soul in me. That might hurt you too. It hurts me when I hear it, because I'm not patient all the time. But that's what proves that God's in you, if you have any patience. So if you've got a little bit, then maybe God's in you. <laughs> okay? Don't worry. <laughs> but it's amazing, though, that you know, you thought you may have thought patience was going to belong way up here somewhere. 
under temperance or something, right? But he wants to include it down here. And I think it may be because there's a certain patience that you have to have with God. Do people not have patience with God? No. Yeah, there's a lot of people that don't have patience with God. You have to, you have to, when something bad happens, you know, the wheel falls off of your car while you're driving on the freeway. <laughs> that ever happened? You, you look at God and you say, Lord, I know you know what you're doing. <laughs> right? That's trust in the Lord and that's patience. Right? Do you lose your mind when, when things don't go right? And then you start sinning? And even like, even, even start saying bad things against God? It happens. So you're limited by that. You get no graces from it either. Yeah, you're limited because the affection of the soul is connected to patience. And the affection is what allows you to get the charity back up into the trunk of the tree. Can you define affection and self-knowledge for everybody, just real quick. Okay. Um, affection of the soul. Well, Did, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not, okay, what's affection of the soul? Yeah. Well, it, it's love that you are able to, you know, develop, you're able to generate on your own. It's your own feelings. And you want to orient those toward God. But charity is a divine love. Yours is a human love. So the affection of the soul is a human love, I believe. It's pretty, this is a hard thing to interpret. But, but does that make sense? Charity, though, is sort of a reward. It's like a grace. And you can only achieve it by a life of growing in holiness. And then you become charitable. It's called the perfection of charity. Am I making sense? Okay, so... Uh, the circle of self-knowledge, I mean, you only you can only recognize who you really are if you know God. People that don't know God and how great he is and all of his plans, if you never read the Bible, could you know yourself? No. Not too well. You have to, have, you have to have heard God's revelation. And you have to have built a relationship with God in order to know at all who you are and what you are. It's like seeing yourself as God sees you. Seeing yourself as God sees you. Okay? By the way, that's kind of coming along. Do you guys ever hear that's going to happen? There's going to be a warning where we're going to end up seeing ourselves as God sees us? Yeah. Well, that'll be a great blessing for everyone. But a lot of people, it'll break their hearts. Okay. All right. So, so it says this. Um, it says, Then the tree of love feeds itself on humility, bringing forth from its side the offshoot of true discretion. In other words, this ability to constantly give everybody their due. Okay? This is kind of what I would say true stewardship is about. That's why I have brought up to you this line of prayer, doctrine, and an example of a holy life, an honorable life. Right? You know, we could just say, I'm going to give time, talent, and treasure. And as long as I check those three boxes off, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're not even really doing good things necessarily. You're kind of guiding yourself. It's not all based on faith, but you're just like, all I know is I'm going to be down there at that soup kitchen. I'll put in my time. But yeah, but didn't you know you have to follow all of God's law? and get to, Oh, no, no, no. Don't worry. I just have to, have to be a good person. And, right? So, but that's where we get lost in stewardship, is if all we're trying to do is check three boxes. Okay? But rather... What we're trying to do is we're trying to focus on having discretion, which is giving everybody what's due, starting with God, then to myself, and then to everybody around me. And what do I owe them? Remember, I owe them all that list. Prayer, it's all for their salvation, ultimately. Might they need some food or, or some clothing? Yeah, but, and you're gonna do that too, because that's actually for their salvation too. They gotta live for a while so they can get converted and go to heaven, all right? But, but you see, so having discretion being able to give, it's really justice, being able to give everybody their due. Um, you see, and, and you're not doing it grudgingly. You're like, I owe it to them. Somebody needs your help. Somebody, somebody even somebody that detracts against you. Remember, uh, St. Catherine used to have this. She would go minister to people, 
And the people she was ministering to would talk bad about her and do evil against her. But she overcame that, right? And she still gave them what was due to them. Why? Because she owed it. She See, if, if every, every time you do somebody some good, you're always thinking like, dang, um, this is bonus for these people. I'm really going out of myself here. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? That's not the way God set stuff up. He, he gave you... Here's the thing about um, obedience and obligation. You're the son of a king of the universe. The king of the universe, right? And you're in his family. So, yeah, he expects you to use the stuff he gave you well. But think about the stuff you're using. To be a human being, to be a Christian, to... To have the, the gift of the knowledge of the, of the um, mysteries of the kingdom of God. You have so much. So when you go off and you prove your virtues with people, you're doing it because you owe it. I owe it. You see how much better of a Christian that's going to make than the person that does everything out of, oh yeah, like I'm doing everybody so many favors. You know what I mean? No, I owe it. I, God has given me so much. Do you realize that you're going to go to heaven? Maybe. To play your cards right. <laughs> Do you know how big heaven is and how good it is? We don't deserve it. We're so lucky that, we, that, that we're... How many Christians... Now, we're not bragging, but how many Christians, true Christians, are there in the world right now that actually know God? Is it a big percentage? You know what the percentage of people that are actually Christian are? Like, by, just by name? What is it? 30 it's about 30% of the world. Christian. All right? That includes Protestantism and everything. Okay? We're actually the biggest. We actually kick Buddhist butts. <laughs> but, you know, not that much, though, because out of that 30%, how many really are just painting that picture that I told you about after the, the idea of Christianity? I'd say out of the 30 Maybe, I mean, I, I don't want to like sound pessimistic to you, but I'd say there's not that, it's not a big percentage of people that actually hear the word of God, which comes to us through the church, and are faithful. How many, how many people are going to church every Sunday? That's a great indication, isn't it? If you're not going to church every Sunday, you're a Catholic, you got a problem. You, you see what I mean? So, so consider yourself blessed, huge, big time. That's why... You're going to have discretion, and in your prayer, you're constantly thanking God for everything he's given you, and even when you go and do a good deed, you do it out of obedience and love of obedience, which I'm going to get into before we leave today, but you do it with discretion, which means that you know you owe it. I owe it. You're like, man, Father Matt, you sure went out of your way. You, you came and did this first, and you did that. And I know, but I owe it. Look at what he gave me. Make sense? Okay, so I think I better finish this off and then we're going to take a quick break and then I'm going to finish it up. I'll do like a half talk on the last thing. Okay, and then the last thing we do after that is we'll have a question and answer and we'll wrap everything up with our thoughts. Okay, Jill. Yeah. You know, they're all part of love. What love I would agree. God's love. I would agree. That's right. It's God's love because the virtue is only developed mm -hmm. by reason and faith, which you got both from God. You got your reason from God. Mm -hmm. You also got your faith from God. And now you, you base everything on truth, the doctrine of Christ. And then you're now able to actually do the good. And you're able to do it because God inspired you to have big fat oars. Of virtue and you need not just one or people are given a gift of one virtue God told st. Catherine that everybody actually has a strength 
in uh, some particular virtue. It's like the one that you're given. And then because you have a little bit of uh, like you've had some good success, you know, and, and what, like if you, if you never had any success in anything, you might give up. <laughs> so, so God at least wants to make sure you're good at something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he gave you, he gave you your, your one virtue that's really strong. And then from there, with all your confidence and all your hope, you're able to build all the rest of the virtues. Does that make sense? All right. So, okay, I'm finishing this up, and then we're going into, or we're going to take a break, and then we're going to go into the last talk, and then we're going to have the final question and answer, right? It's still only 2 o'clock. Don't be acting like you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> and, then there, and then there's tomorrow's masses, too. Don't be acting tired in mass. You get to bed and get some sleep. <laughs> No, I will admit, I will admit, what I just taught you in this whole thing of the, the tree, it's complicated. I had to sit here and struggle to put it together. I kept reading this over and over again, like, what is God saying? All I know is I don't want to give up on it because I like it better, honestly, than even that book that the Dominican wrote. I, I like this better. So, uh, you know, I hope you guys, you, you want to figure this out, too. We got, because, you know, this is the best thing we got is what God told to Catherine of Siena. It's just, I don't know of anything else. Okay, so this is one more thing that he said. Hey, can I drink that water? Yes, oh, that's sure. mine anyway. <laughs> I just, just wanted to make sure I could. <laughs> okay, listen up. Are you tired? You better not be. <laughs> okay, ready? Okay, ready? Yeah. So he said, he said, this tree then is so sweetly planted, uh, this tree, so sweetly planted, produces fragrant blossoms of virtue. Why fragrant? Don't you realize that when you have virtue, you didn't even have to throw down on the doctrine. But you still need to do that too. Don't exonerate yourself. But you see what I'm saying? R walk around this earth with a bunch of virtue and you will have preached the gospel. Like that thing that we attribute to St. Francis. But that's not everything. But it's a blossom of fragrance. Holiness is attractive. It gives glory to God and then it causes everybody to, around you to be attracted to that and to do it themselves, right? So it's fragrant. Um with many scents of great variety, inasmuch as the soul renders fruit of grace and of utility for her neighbor. So remember, what's this whole day based on? I'm asking you guys questions like, okay, uh, God gives you money, and then you need to invest it and give him back a uh, return on his money, right? And I asked you, what is the fruit? Well, he's kind of naming it right here. What's the fruit? What's the return on the money? He says, fruit of grace and of utility to your neighbor. Okay, but not just that. According to the zeal, and I already read this before, but according to the zeal of those who come to receive fruit from my servants. In other words, so it does depend on them. Don't be disheartened because your children will not go to church even though you've done a great job. Maybe you've done a great job. I don't know. And they just don't want to accept it. The devil's powerful. The, 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 the world, the devil, and the flesh. If you got, I know a lot of you guys, that you're, that, that's driving you crazy. That you've got family members that, are, that don't seem to be on the path to heaven. Believe me, I've come from nine kids in my family, and there's only three of us that practice the faith, and I'm one of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so, too. So, so, out of nine kids, well, one's passed away, but there's five more. Uh, they, they got lost. And is it my fault? I'm trying. But same with you guys, okay? So, don't forget that. So, it said... Um, it said, uh, fruits of grace and of utility to her neighbor, according to the zeal of those who come to receive fruit from my servants. And to me she renders sweet odor of glory and praise to my name, and so fulfills the object of her creation. I read to that to you before. Now I'm fitting it into the tree of virtue. Okay? So you rec recognize this tree is going gonna, is gonna to bring you to your proper end of a human life. You are a tree of love. 
comes through virtue, okay? And, um, and this is what it means to give a return on the investment that God made, all right? So what are, what, but, but, but what, what is the fruit? He said it's, it's what you're giving to your neighbor and to him because it's due, okay? And really to yourself, remember? You start there because you can't give anything to your neighbor, neighbor until you give to yourself first, right? In other words, you got to become holy and you got to have virtue so that you can properly, uh, what did he say? The fruit of grace and utility to your neighbor. You're helping them to have grace. You're helping them to their salvation by your prayer, doctrine, and example. Okay. Now, in this way, therefore, she reaches the term of her being, that is, myself, her God, who am eternal life. And these fruits cannot be taken from her without her will, inasmuch as they are all flavored with discretion. You see how important discretion is? Put that into your prayer life, discretion. Because they are all united as has been said above, all the virtues, but discretion is important, right? It's part of this trunk. Charity, discretion. Giving God what is due. That's right, giving God what is due. Now, he says, self-love is a tree on which grow nothing but fruits of death, putrid flowers, stained leaves, branches bowed, bowed down, and st struck by various winds. This is the tree of the soul, for you are all trees of love, and without love, you cannot live, for you have been made by me for love. The soul who lives virtuously places the root of her tree in the valley of true humility. But those who live thus miserably are planted on the mountain of pride. Whence it follows that since the root of the tree is badly planted, the tree cannot bear fruits of life, but only of death. Their fruits are their actions, which are all poisoned by many and diverse kinds of sin. And if they should produce some good fruit among their actions, even it will be spoiled by the foulness of its root. For no good actions done by the soul in mortal sin are of value for eternal life, for they are not done in grace. God's words, not mine. Let not, however, such a soul abandon on account of its good works, for every good deed is rewarded. And we already went into that. We said he gives them more time. And there's other things too, but I won't go into that right now. But the last part here is, um, is he says, okay, no, that's it. Okay, so one last thought. The, the dialogue tells us that God is always interested in us developing this tree, right? And, and the tree is what's going to lead you to your proper end. And that's what we, we said, right? Now, the tree comes by way of other human beings. The, 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 the hermits, they, 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 uh, they may be praying for other people, but they are lacking in this benefit. Because if you notice that certain people in your life are, they cause you a lot of struggle, it may just be that God put those people in your life because you need to gain that virtue. Because they are the people that are going to test those virtues for you. Right? So if you don't have anybody in your life that causes you to be patient, maybe you already got enough patience. I don't know. But if you don't have patience, you'll be sure to find people. Because God's going to bring them to you. Okay? <laughs> so when you know that, when you know that, you don't resent those people. You don't resent those people. They are an avenue for you. All the saints live that way. They recognize that the people around them that cause them to have to uh, overcome themselves, overcome their, sensu their, their selfish sensuality, okay, and their sinfulness in order to be virtuous. And they say, thank you, Lord. Jill. I heard uh, someone speak of those incidents where people that bother you. <laughs> yep, and, and that's what we do with the uh, the virtues for the school. We go out there and okay, if you on the day on the week we do patience, we go out and find those people with love. So I'm going to be bummed out if all of a sudden <laughs> this busload of people comes up to uh, Quincy and they're saying, "We were looking for a way to to grow in patience." So here we are, Father. <laughs> okay, so. 
we're going to now uh, go into our little groups, and uh, there should be, the, okay, so I have some questions for this section. Um, let me just read them to you, and I'm going to have to end the video so I can look at those. Unless you, do you have those questions? Uh-huh. Yeah. No, it's right. this one, but I, you forget my notes. Okay, my notes. so session two, the development and perfection of the virtues, holiness and love. Number one, what is a virtue? Number two, how do you prove your virtue? How do you prove it? How do you prove it? How do you prove your virtue? Number three, what do you think makes virtue particularly Christian? Number four, what is the virtue of discretion? Number five, what is your strongest virtue? Am I going too fast? Yeah. <laughs> we'll write them. You want to write them up there? Can we write them? Sure. Okay. And then I'm just gonna, I'm going to finish them though here. Uh, what are some signs that a person is not a tree of love? And number seven, what should I do specifically? to perfect the virtues in myself. Like me, what do I personally need to do to perfect the virtues in myself, okay? So go ahead and we're gonna take 10 minutes to do that and then go to the bathroom and then I'm gonna give you the last talk and I'll, I'll keep that one somewhat short. Then we'll have some time for discussion, okay?